I'm Lauren. Welcome to Publisher Group Talks. The aim of this channel here today is to create a platform to help educate, inform and inspire. Our motto is Arrive Smart, Leave Smarter and the purpose of our channel is actually creating a digital mentorship program for creatives and that's the focus it is a place for creatives regardless of what they're doing to tune in to a platform that has information that we feel is informative and interesting inspirational and helps guide them in various aspects <laughs> today our studio guest is marcel murray welcome marcel thank you it's good to be here it's nice to have you here we're actually in the studio of free life so marcel has been kind enough to let us come back to the studio and record another season or another episode here because we were here before when we did Basil and Luke. So mm. thank you, Free Lives, as well. Cool. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Good to have you guys here. Yeah. yeah, thank you. We just want to give the, or we'll always say, audience, listeners, um, those who are engaging with our podcast, a bit of a brief um, bio on you. So I'm just going to just introduce you, basically, who you are and what you're doing, and then we'll go into the focus of the show. So Marcel's an animator, he's an editor and an illustrator and project manager. He's been in the industry since 2006 and I had a look at his CV, so to speak, and his cover's full of various hats he's worn and he continues to wear and he's really multi-talented. He works at Free Lives, he's an artist and art director. He maintains and controls the art and art direction. And from everything from like project management to getting involved in the game design process, his talents are far and wide. He can be found in many different places. He was the lead art director for Gorn. He worked on genital jousting. His portfolio includes Disney interactive games, including Cars as well as Frozen. So yeah. the little kids out there are like, Frozen! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <A lot. That's, laughs> you, you must be singing the song, you know. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I'm not a fan of the film or the song, but um, it's a big franchise and obviously kids love it. So whenever you're speaking to yeah. them and they ask you what you do, it's like... You must be the hero. Uh, yeah, it's like you're immediately like the favorite uncle or, or whatever yeah. it is, whatever the situation is. They're like fascinated. Um, but yeah, mm. I didn't work on the film. Uh, but yeah, sometimes it's a bit hard for the kids to understand that part. Yes, so it's more <laughs> like the interact trying to explain to them what an interactive game yeah. element is part of that. I was basically just, it was basically uh, educational games. So you basically tell the kids and then they get excited and then you show them the games. Um, and it's it's pretty cool. I f I think like uh, I feel pretty strongly about education in games. Yes. So I feel like that was pretty. That's yeah. I'm pretty proud of that stuff. That's yeah. really cool. I mean, I think that's where we also kind of connect as well because I'm also passionate about education and everything that our team does is about educating and also having you here to work as a digital mentor for the others or the other creatives and you could say anyone else who's listening that may be inspired and wants to be educated by the knowledge that you have to share. Yeah, I'll try to share what pills of wisdom I've got. <laughs> oh, okay, you've got a few. You just, you know, dive right into it. And yeah. I think the first thing is to say that the focus of the show is we're going to look at in this one with you is work ethic, uh, is employment, and looking at some freelance advice for creatives. So I'd like to start off by asking you if you were to explain what is work ethic to you personally. How would you verbalize that? Okay, well... I think that's, that's a pretty deep question for me, um, especially working at Free Labs where we all have very unrestricted hours uh, and uh, it's not really about putting in X amount of hours per week, it's about how much work you get, you produce, it's about just getting your job done and we're all here and we're all like aiming for the same goals which is making the best possible content we can. Um, so that being said, uh, it, you know, it raises certain questions about work ethic but I think it applies even to young students and a lot of them don't quite understand what that means. Um, for me, sitting at your desk from nine to five and being there at nine o'clock every morning and as soon as one minute past five hits the clock, you're out of the office, you know, you're filling your obligation to your employer by, you know, sitting there X amount of hours, but that doesn't necessarily mean your work ethic is uh, up to scratch or any good. To me, work ethic, comes down to basically reliability, especially in a production of any kind. Um, if you're in a bigger team, I think it matters even more because it comes down to a process of uh, step one is done by one person, step two is done by another, step three is done by the next one. And if, not, if uh, the creative number one isn't pulling their weight, it has a whole ricochet effect. Um, so yeah, I think it comes down to a couple of different things and I think it's a very tricky question, especially for creatives 
because uh, he, cr- for me, creativity is quite a tough thing to kind of force. So if you're having an off day, how do you still maintain a good work ethic? Um, and I think it comes down to like a few different uh, factors. Like I say, it's a very, it's a very deep question. I don't know if I'm doing, no, doing, you're doing answer great. any justice. Yeah, no, you're doing great. Uh, but yeah, what I'm trying to say is there's a very old school mentality out there um, that I don't necessarily think applies to uh, real creativity very well, which is you've got to work your, you know, nine to five, nothing after weekends is your time. And it's just, I think in a creative realm, that, that's not quite how it works. So it can be very difficult, especially for young people, especially for young creatives, because they're young creatives and they're full of emotions and great ideas and rightfully so. But then, you know, all these other questions start coming, uh, arising, sorry, and piling up. Mm-hmm. And it all comes down to adding up on pressure. Um, and it's also about, I think, um, trying to bridge the gap between management and employers and like actual creatives and distinguishing what what is expected, what is the end goal. Is it for you to sit there and just fill in your weekly count of hours or, or are you trying to produce X amount of content? Or, uh, yeah. Uh, just one other thing with regard to work ethic, and that comes down to like uh, hitting your deadlines, uh, hitting your expectations, um, and if you are going to be late, which is common practice in any creative realm, uh, it's about having the maturity to communicate that with whoever you're dealing with, and that applies to permanent. If you're permanently employed, whether you're freelancing, anything. I've learned these things the hard way, mm. and we all think, especially being young and creative, that we're doing something wrong. We're doing something wrong because there isn't anyone to really point us in the right way or, or, you know, tap us on the shoulder and say, yeah, good job. This is, you're doing good or maybe do that. So we're all kind of left to our own devices and that just breeds stress. Um, But for me, good work ethic is really good communication. Speaking to your employer and letting them know any issues you have. Um, And I think that is kind of universal in a lot of realms. We all seem to be too scared to speak up because we're going to have our skills judged. Um, Whereas we should actually just be like, this is the situation. This is the reason it's long, whatever the case may be. I'm going to need a few more days or a few more hours or whatever the case is. And if they have a problem with that, that's fine. But it's a lot better than the deadline coming and you send them a mail saying, sorry, I need another two days. They've made commitments and promises to clients or whatever the case may be. And by you just leaving them on the lurch, that's putting everybody in a terrible situation. Yeah, it's worse than yeah. stealing pencils. It's My dad terrible. told me that was bad work ethic when I was little. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, don't steal pencils. <laughs> it's like, yeah. But what most importantly is like, don't let the team down is what you're saying. Yeah. And, you know, communication, which... And, and actually, I think communication is something that needs to be taught. It's not actually something that people... I want to say it's not a natural 100%. gift. I, you know, obviously I stand to correction, but I really think it isn't because communication is an art and you have to learn how to really be able to communicate well, especially when it comes to clients and not fulfilling client expectations. Yeah. Now we'll touch on that in another episode that we do, but um, definitely you're spot on with that. It's just the one other thing I wanted to add to mm. work ethic is just like going back to the nine to five situation. It's like, in any creative realm, if you think that you're going to be amazing, which you do, by just filling in your, like the amount of hours you have to do per week, you're never going to be good. And I can tell you that for free. People can call me out and tell me I'm arrogant, but I can guarantee you, you are not going to be mm. the best. And you're probably going to fall off the bandwagon. You might get a job for a few years, but if you aren't putting in the energy and effort to further your skills all the time. I mean, I'm not saying like every single minute of every day, but yes. if you aren't constantly pursuing to further your skills, you're gonna you're gonna fall behind. I mean, yeah. the way that the current industry is working with the digital age, people are able to learn anything they want in their home, just sitting online. People are also able to do anything they want by being online. You can download programs for free. You can download learning material. There's so much more content out there, out there, sorry. And for me, what that does is it kind of, it brings up two different things. One is there's more people doing it. So the competition becomes a lot harder. And the second thing, which is kind of great and scary, is the technology is constantly advancing. Hmm. So there's constantly new tools out there making things easier. 
but that also means things are getting easier so more people can do it. So it's kind of that cycle where the industry just starts rapidly growing. And I think we can all say that even Photoshop is now starting to become common practice amongst people. Yeah. I mean, people that aren't even in a creative industry no. have the ability to go and put together a flyer or whatever the case in Photoshop. Yeah, 90% of the clients that we oh. deal with with our Photoshop training and in design are actually corporate clients and aren't creatives. Exactly. Which shows you. And yeah. a lot of people um, in the past have criticized me and said, you know, that should not these creative applications be limited into the creative field and that the corporates shouldn't have access to them. But actually, it's actually a good thing for the corporates. And I know some corporates out there that I've done training with over the years, and they are, they are more proficient in the applications yeah. than a creative sitting at an agency. I know. And, does, That's scary. and to add to that, you will sometimes have a director on a commercial or production and they don't even know how to open Photoshop. Yeah. So, I mean, and going back to your argument, I think that uh, that statement saying that it should only be kept for the creatives, that that's quite like naive in a sense. Mm. Uh, like the more people that are using it, again, going back to my previous statement, the more people are using it, the, the higher the bar gets pushed. So you ha constantly have this elevation of just general talent constantly around the world being pushed. And also tools are being developed. And the more people that use things, the more content there. And that definitely will seem scary to people that are using these tools for their bread and butter. But unfortunately, that's just, that's just the way the world works. Yeah. And the world is going to continue to work like that. And they're going to have to up their game. They're not yeah. going to have a chance. Exactly. I'd like to ask you, what do you think that the industry is like for the up-and-coming animators, for those who want to be involved with game design? Wow, that's a big question. I think it's quite tough. Uh, do you mean like uh, locally, like uh, or in let's South say, Africa? Let's say or in, in South Africa, because yeah. I'm kind of going for the audience that I know sure. we have European listeners, mm -hmm. but we've got South Africa's really moving towards yeah. the game design industry. It's become very big over the last five years. Yes, it has. And I think there's a lot of people that are still left behind. Like there seems to be this constant division. Uh, it's almost like an old school well, old school mentality in, a, in 3D animation, which seems crazy because it still feels so new in terms of an actual industry. But basically for a long time, animation was predominantly getting pumped into feature film and uh, animation. Mostly, I mean, sorry, advertising. Mostly advertising in this country. So what you would have is you would have a few big production companies and you would have, uh, at a, as, it, as the years progressed, you had a few small, smaller boutique studios coming up which almost have like a bit of a plug and play policy, which is they have a few core people and what they do is they plug in freelancers as they need uh, or contractors as they need and plug them up when they don't. That way they don't have over like overheads when they don't have uh, any productions uh, to bring in any money. So the, the way that, um, the way that it works now is it's a lot more varied and game engines themselves are becoming so powerful that I personally believe that in the future people aren't going to be doing all these huge renderings and everything else that they have been doing for years, which cost a lot of money by either having a render farm or sending them overseas to huge uh, uh, render farms internationally, which cost a fair amount of money. Now I believe things are becoming more interactive. People are going to start using the game engines for films, for series because they can have so much ability and power and flexibility and even interactivity. Uh, all of these things uh, are now possible. Um, so I think there's still this old school mentality where there's this divide between animation for advertising mm -hmm. and film and actual interactiv interactivity, such as games and things like that. So I think more people need to realize that it's possible. Um, and just to add to it, I'm sorry, I know I'm waffling, but to add to it, there's another aspect which is boosting the industry, which is the service industry. So what that is, is basically people doing service work for external companies, either in Europe or America, because we've got the rant to dollar or the rant to euro, we're looking more and more attractive to the international markets for them to do a lot of the groundwork, to lay down what they need, and then they send it over to us to basically execute that. Uh, and that, that applies for casino work, for all kinds of games and all kinds of industries and companies. Um, and yeah, that's a growing industry. So there's more and more of those, which some people may say they hate that kind of work, but I see it as a massive benefit. Um, you know, you've kind of got to work with international clients. You've got to be business savvy with international folks. There's so much things you can learn for that. And also your work has to be 
uh, at a production level of an international standard. So yeah, I think that in its own right is boosting the local industry quite a bit. Um, and I know of quite a few local freelancers that are now only looking at those markets uh, and, and freelancing only for those markets because the money's good, the clients are good, they're professional, they have a solid background and they have their industries well developed, whereas in South Africa it's a bit more of a gung-ho industry. Um, I feel mm. like I've deviated from the question quite a bit. No, no, not um, at all. I mean, do you think that those who are... Um, let's say freelancing and they've come out of college and they've studied uh, the necessary bits and pieces that they need to, they go straight into freelancing. Do you think that that's an injustice to the industry or? Mm. It's tough. Uh, no. I've seen people from both spectrums. So I've seen people on both spectrums that have really succeeded and some of them even have their own companies now and some of them that have kind of failed. So I think to a large degree, it, it does apply to a person's personality. Some people just have certain sense of maturity to go about dealing with clients extremely professionally from the get-go or just having a sense of uh, time management, which is a huge benefit for freelancing. And then I've also seen people that haven't, but they're amazingly creative. They're insanely talented, but that's what they are, insanely talented. And they're not really aware of their own time. And they're always trying to do something better and waffle off in a creative direction that's not necessarily appropriate. So I think for me personally, I see huge benefits in um, people going out and finding a proper employment at a production company. If you can, a good production company, try to do your research and get in there. To me, uh, my first employment was Black Ginger. And that to me was really, uh, to a large degree, my actual studying. When I got in there, that's when I really got a taste of the industry. You get a taste of industry standard. You get to work with other really good people, which at a young age is a huge benefit because you're feeding off of people and you're doing that in college, but everybody's still learning and fumbling around. So you're learning bits and pieces, but you really get the knowledge when you're working in a proper production environment where the knowledge you're getting isn't someone else kind of learning something and sharing it with you. It's someone who's you know, a trained professional and you're getting that information, you're getting that work ethic. And furthermore, you're building up your portfolio. I mean, you freelancing is kind of like fishing and your showreel content is kind of like your bait so if you don't go and create any bait which you know for me is like working at a production company or any legitimate studio for a few years how do you really go out and get clients mm. which is another i guess another whole podcast but it's vitally important to have good content and it's vitally important to have that production knowledge i don't think i'd be where i am today if i didn't take the route that i did which was spending some solid years at a proper production environment. And the, the other thing is networking and relationships. I mean, especially if you're starting out, one of the key things is meeting people and keeping those relationships going, which I'm probably pretty bad at. Um, but I think there's huge benefits in it. And if you are going to freelance, you need to make contacts. So if you go from college straight into freelancing, you have no bait and you have no lakes to fish in. So, well, you think uh, you have your portfolio that you've built up at college and that's good enough. I've yeah. seen some CVs come along my desk where... Students have been at college and they've done like a mini portfolio, etc. And then they sent it through. And you can see that they've got a long way to go in what they're offering or what they're asking, you know. Mm. And it comes back to what we spoke about um, just off the camera that uh, freelancers and young creatives coming into the industry are asking for quite high salaries. And their pricing is kind of messing up the industry yeah. and creating problems. Uh, how are you experiencing that? Well, I think there's kind of two sides to that, and they're both pretty extreme. On one hand, you've got people that are entering the industry, and they they, they don't know what to, to charge because, the not to state any of the institutions, but they're not getting taught like any business savvy. They're not getting taught what their value is. They're not even leaving there with any indication of what they should be asking for when they get employment, when they get called up for an interview. One of the first things the employer is going to ask you when you sit down for the interview is, what do you want to earn? Hopefully, that's the case. You should know. You should never be, oh, I don't know. And most of them don't know. So they'll look at other professions that aren't relatable to what they're doing. And they're either charging way too low or way too high. And if they're charging way too low, that is also a problem. Because now when you, when you have proper freelancers or let me say experienced freelancers coming in, their rates seem unjustifiable because you've got students that are charging such small amounts. On the other hand, you have some students that are coming in and charging 
absolutely insane amounts of money because they're looking at an international standard. They're looking at an international day rate and then they're applying it to the South African currency, which is just kind of mind-blowing in its own right. Um, but in a, it, it's kind of a tough thing because one, what I've found is on the opposite side, a lot of companies have varied rates that they accept. Some companies are stock standard. They know what the industry sta- standard is. Others are completely baffled by the local like st- standard day rate. Um, so I think... As much as the young people entering the market are confused, there's a lot of people that are actually running businesses that are also confused. So it seems like there's a lot of confusion out there. I think it's that lack of communication and the lack of collaboration is that we seem to kind of go into a corner and say, this is my information, I'm going to hold on to it and I don't want to share it. And if I tell you what I charge per hour, then are you going to charge the same and then are we going to have to compete instead of creating a system where there's more communication, there's more openness. I I just find that even in my industry, the designers are not that forthcoming with sharing those kind of um, bits of information. 100%, yeah. yeah. And another aspect of it is how do you measure a day? I mean, if you have someone who's got five years of experience and you give them a task, a lot of people can't, like in management or people running companies, they don't necessarily know how long that takes. So if someone who's got five years experience, he could whip that out in half an hour because he's got some tool that he's found on the internet. But because management doesn't know, they're kind of getting like completely overcharged. And on the other right, they could be getting a student that's charging a ridiculous amount of money and not know the proper time expectation for whatever his task is and end up paying him an absurd amount of money for something that they should be paying one fifth of. So yeah, um, it's very very confusing, it's very very tough. I do Mm. feel that, you know, some of these organizations like Animation SA or whatever the relevant organizations are to the different industries, they really need to have a page on their websites where they have some kind of downloadable template and it can just be a basic guide for people because I promise you, I can't tell you how many people have come to me in this industry and said, what is a good rate? What is a good rate I should be charging? And how do I go about um, identifying that rate? And then the next big question, second biggest question I always get asked, how do I work a package deal? Barely anyone wants a 3D artist or animator or maybe an illustrator for a day, but I doubt it. They generally will go for a week, depending on the project, maybe a month, maybe even six months. So if you're going to charge a day rate as a freelancer, that adds up very quickly if you take into account 20 Plus minus days and your work doesn't become worth it at the end of the day because yeah. you're paying like 50 grand and the person exactly. doing something. So how do you balance that out? Mm. How do you work it out? How do you identify your own skill? All these things are really important and I don't think a lot of people know how to go about doing it. I sure as hell didn't. I had to figure it out the hard way. And I had to make a whole lot of mistakes to go about doing that. And I just feel that it just shouldn't have to be that hard. It really shouldn't. How would you, how, if, you, if you're being asked those questions, what's the advice that you give back when someone asks well, you? Well, again, I say to them straight, it's very tough. It's hard. Um, like I, I can't give you a flat-out standard rate that applies to everybody because in a creative realm, and you definitely know this, different people have different strengths and weaknesses. You get some people that are just amazing and can do everything. Like a lot of people here are just too talented. It's actually insulting. Um, but you get some people that just have their certain uh, faults and strengths. So h- how do you kind of go about identifying those things and balancing it out and working out your self-worth for that? And again, looking at a production, looking what's required of you, managing to judge your own time and seeing how fast you can do a particular task, all these things coming to effect. So it's a tough question for me. I like to be able to actually know the person, know yes, their work. see their portfolio. To some degree, see know, I know what their skill set is mm-hmm. and also have a general idea of what they're going to be uh, doing. If they're going to be working in film or commercial or games. Those uh, are different genres. Uh, yeah, to some mm-hmm. degree. They should all be the same, but it, it goes. it all goes in hand with what that person's skill mm-hmm. is and what they're offering. Mm-hmm. There are obviously standards that apply here and there, but... Uh, it's very one-on-one, or very specific, if I may mm. say. To some degree. To mm. some mm. degree. No, it makes sense. It makes sense. I mean, what, from your perspective and advice to an aspiring creative wanting to achieve and work in the position that you're in, and they say, I want to be just like you, I want to do the job oh. you're doing, and 
What did you tell them? Wow, that's a tough one. Was... They say, how do I get, how do I become like Marcel? Marcel, what did you study? Where, uh, how, what do I do? I wouldn't and... advise them to take do anything I did. I think <laughs> I took the long route for everything yeah. and I still am. Um, I don't know. I think that's a tough question. Um, I don't see myself in a, in a, in a position that uh, is very idyllic for younger people. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I guess, you know, the thing is, when I, when I started out, and I kind of say this to everybody, you should never work for free. But when you're coming up, you should be hungry. You should want to put in the time and effort into your projects. You should want to display the best work you can. But understanding what's required of you is also just as important. So you personally can want to make the best thing in the world, but you need to understand what is required of you and how do you do that the best. So I think like putting in a lot of time and effort into personal projects, when you're starting out, I would say definitely try to find somewhere to put your passion and your personal work. I was lucky. I'm... I met a great guy or two great guys, Claudio Pavan and Ari Reshko. In my first job, they were doing some pilot and music videos. I don't know if you remember the little tinfoil characters running around. That was done like after hours by a group of guys, mainly Claudio, um, for a few months. And that was just a, a love project. So we started then, we saw this, that friend of my, myself and a friend, and we just wanted to animate. And we were like, please, like we, we want to animate. And he basically said, cool, great, like help me out do some animation, he would give us feedback, we would learn, and yes, we were still going and doing our job and putting all our effort and energy into that because we wanted to make a success of it. But now we had this other thing to invest our passions. And why I think that's so important is because at a very young age, you get to place your passion and your energy into someone else's hands that have a, has a bit more production knowledge. So your work is actually gonna get utilized and you're gonna see it, you're gonna watch, like for, for me, I got to watch the, the music video on TV with some friends at a random moment. And the magic I felt was indescribable, especially at a young age. And I was just stimulated to do even more work, like be more creative and do more passionate things. So it snowballs. Why I say it's important to try and invest that or look at a place to invest that into someone else's hands was because you can have all the energy in the world. And especially if you're young, you're going to... You're almost going to get yourself into a creative flurry of just tripping over your own feet. You're going to get overwhelmed at times. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to break things. And you're going to be all alone. And that's very daunting, especially if you're young and eager. And it, you, one has to be very careful of not stifling that flame. So that's why I think it's a huge benefit to collaborate with other people. Um, in particular, I think it's good to collaborate with friends. But if you have any form of older mentors around you, Pledge your allegiance, offer your services, learn some stuff, work with people. You're going to be advancing your skills, not only creatively, but also personally. You're going to learn to work with people. You're going to learn to take feedback. Um, and when the time's right, then you take everything you've learned and you can apply it into your own work and your own projects. And that's really cool. That's, that's really amazing. rad. Yeah. Amazing. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> and random question before we end. Yeah. What's the best advice you were ever given? That's, that's just oh. something that just stuck with you and just sort of played around in your head for many years. Yeah, okay. There's, I think there's one in particular, again, by one of my mentors, Claudio. Um, I ended up working with him for many years, and he had some very amazing like thoughts that he shared with me. Or let's call them pearls of wisdom. And um, it basically, it, there's a little story behind it, not to waffle, but um, I was doing, I was entering a competition, an illustration competition. I was about 24 and very attached to my work and I came second and not first in the competition and a friend of mine actually beat me and he was an illustrator and I was so upset I was like I put so much time and I, I just thought I had it so it caught me by surprise and the fact that it was a friend really like kind of left me a bit winded um, so yeah I was feeling really down and he came up to me and he saw much effort and he said you need to realize how much you, you do you do 3d you do this you do that you do this that guy, he's only doing illustration. So you can't sit and judge your work and get down about it if you're not at that level. If you want to be at that level, then pump all your energy into it and get to that level. But you need to identify what you want to do with life. It's not about being the best at everything. It's about what do you want to create? What do you want to do? Um, and I think that to me was really important because I suddenly realized, I was like, my whole intentions were wrong. I was trying to do this to stroke my ego and to win something, 
to have my name mm. on next to number one. And I was like, that that actually isn't me. That isn't my personality. That's not what is going to make me a better creative. Winning competitions is for a certain type of person. And it's not for me. So I guess in a nutshell, what I'm trying to say is don't put yourself up against some crazy ZBrush artist in Poland or some Pixar animator that works on a shot for two years and you get two days to do your shot. You, you need to be very aware of what you're comparing your work to. Um, and I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. I think it's extremely important to always have high ambitions and high examples of what you want your work to be. But we as creatives have a tendency to beat ourselves up and f- get very emotional and very depressed about our work not being as good as we want it. And yeah, so I guess turning it into my piece of advice again is just don't let anything like try and ruin your your creative spirit. Like always keep that always keep that going, always keep that hungry. Yeah. Nice. And identify your skills. Like don't don't be worried about what other people do. Find inspiration in that. Yeah. And do your thing. Yeah, just do your thing. Yeah. Exactly. Could have, said that. Could have said that a lot shorter, I think. No, you said it perfect. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you so much. Okay, cool. And Great. just want to say thank you to the audience. We're going to give yeah, you links you. to Marcel's LinkedIn profile, his Facebook or email, something you can get in touch with him. We'll make it accessible okay. and easy to find him. Great. And we just like to say that if you guys have something you'd like to bring to the table, a skill to contribute, a passion for sharing, if you have something you want to educate, inform, inspire, we encourage you to make contact with us because that's what makes the show so collaborative in its approach is just unique individuals coming forward and sharing things with us. And even if you're overseas, doesn't matter because we still we're working on like a Skype plan and we can Skype with you. So we want to hear from you. Email us. Hello at publishergroup.com. And until next time, high five myself. <laughs> Thanks. For See you guys me. later. Cheers.